Hello, Remix 16. Welcome to your third official church document on Catholic education to teach as Jesus did, a pastoral message on Catholic education. This was written in 1972 by what will become the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. Joining me today is Mr. Carl Lesh. Carl, thanks for being here. Good to be with you. Awesome. And so, Remix 16, we definitely appreciate all of your efforts to continue to digest these documents on Catholic education, and so we look forward to helping you unpack this one. So, To Teach As Jesus Did, again, written in 1972, it's a pastoral letter, so I think it's important that we understand what that is. We had a conciliar document with Gravissimum, we had an encyclical written by a pope with Divini, and so here, basically what we have is a teaching that was brought out by, in this case, a group of bishops within our country. And so if you want to go a little bit deeper, there's a link there, and that's in the slides that will accompany this video. But ultimately, it's, it's a way that the bishop, or again, a group of bishops over their diocese or group of dioceses, would write a letter to the faithful in order to help instruct them as far as the faith is concerned. And that's what we have here in this document. We also, so to continue to keep in mind, the three different ways that our church will try to impart that faith and all three of these working together. So just to remember, scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, so the teaching authority of the church. And to think that all three of those work together at all times, that even scripture itself, friends, if you think of it, um, it was not written immediately, that it was an oral tradition that was passed on, but then ultimately the Bible that we have was selected by the teaching authority of the church. And so what we'll have once again with this church document is an interplay of those three foundations or those three kind of mechanisms of teaching within our church. The role of scripture, and Carl, the, the role of scripture here, um, what, what, can you, what can you tell us about it within to teach as Jesus did? So, as you look at the longer documents than the other ones we've read recently, uh, it's heavier on the scripture references at the beginning than in the middle of the end. I would just, as you're reading through, just kind of know what books of the Bible are the references referring back to. Um, and, and I'll refer a few, couple other things on scripture later on as we continue the conversation. Awesome. But scripture is there, um, maybe just not as heavy as it was at least in Divinity. And so just keep that in mind. Teaching and Tradition, um, Gravissimum, from 1965, so our Vatican II document on Catholic education, it's going to be cited nine times, and this is a long document. It's over 150 passages or paragraphs, and so nine times, though, Gravissimum is, is mentioned, and that is the most of any document within this particular one, To Teach As Jesus Did. Divini is going to be referenced once, so just keep your eyes out for that. And then there are 12 total documents. So in addition to Gravissimum and Divini, there's 10 others. Six of those, including Gravissimum, come from the Second Vatican Council. So you definitely see, this is seven years after the close of that council, um, you see definitely the church within our country responding to the teachings that came out of Vatican II. And I think there were only 16 documents promulgated from Vatican II, so they're referencing almost half of that. Almost, right. <clears throat> a big emphasis within this document. In fact, this is really kind of the meat and potatoes of it is this threefold educational mission of the church. Carl, can you take us through what this, what this approach is? So time and time again throughout this document, they're going to hit uh, one, two, three message, community service, message, community service. And um, I would kind of hold that. And as you look at later documents, you'll see that it doesn't just stick with three levels, that there are really four. Um, but yet this document does bring in this fourth one that we note here for you, uh, liturgy and worship. Um, but every uh, aspect of education, I think a key thing about the document, this is a really broad swipe that Michael's gonna talk about in terms of adult education and religious education for children, youth ministry. They look at always through these three lenses and that's gonna be important to carry that through all 150 paragraphs. Awesome, thanks Carl. <clears throat> and so we'll, we'll kind of take you through. So the first part of the document focuses in on that threefold mission, again, of message, of, of teaching and learning, of then of community, how we're bringing people together, how are we um, 
fostering that within the people that are within our, our groups and our schools, our churches. And then finally, service, that it's meant to, our, our instruction and then our faith is meant to draw us out into the world, push us out to go make the world a better place. So after that opening, this document, in addition to Divinity, if you remember, there was a huge emphasis on kind of the, the dangers or at least people being a little scared at that point of um, media at the time and, and this advance of technology. And we had a little bit in Gravissimum, but technology is going to come back into play in this one. And so they'll go through that. The bishops will talk a little bit about that. And then the main part. So after this opening on message, community and service, and then a brief kind of touch on technology is giving form to the vision. And as Carl said, this is a, a broad view of Catholic education. And so we might often think, and, and I think I was probably guilty of this the first time reading through it, that this is gonna be about Catholic schools. But in fact, it's not um, just about Catholic schools. The church is talking about now, we need to do a better job with young adults. How do we keep them in the church? How do we continue to form them? And this document is naming this back in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. That how do we look at adult education? They spend a fair amount of time on that. They do. So, you know, really about 25 paragraphs in this document are specifically about Catholic schools. And so I think it's just helpful to step back and say the church is educating people over the whole lifespan and really kind of giving us a vision for that. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps us because we understand that our work is part of the mission of the church, as we had in our one of our opening sections that Catholic schools don't have missions but the mission has Catholic schools. And in fact, the mission has then adult education, higher education, campus ministry. So this whole list of things that to teach as Jesus did, we'll touch upon. And so Catholic schools will, you'll get to that about one third of the way through the document. You'll get to actually like talking about um, the parts that Catholic schools should, um, you know, are, are referenced about or, or that pertain to Catholic schools, but all these other components. And to think about, as Carl said, this heavy focus on adult education that I think for most of us as Catholics, we almost assume that our Catholic education in a broad sense is over when we get confirmed. And then maybe we enter back into it for marriage or for maybe our kids receiving the sacraments, but ultimately we kind of have it figured out. And this document is gonna help us to see that that's not the case, that it's an ongoing, that we need to be lifelong learners, not only of education, but also of our faith. After it goes through giving form to the vision, it's gonna wrap up. So the last kind of part of the document will talk about planning for the overall educational mission. And there's a heavy emphasis on cooperation. So cooperation between and among all the various groups that we just had on the last slide. And so to think about how do schools need to interface with higher education? How should catechetical programs, faith formation programs, how should those benefit from the good that's happening within Catholic schools? So all of those really working together they're all part of the same mission. And so how can they really cooperate and, and be in synthesis and, and synergistic relationships with each other? But then also there's this great call to innovation. And I think this was written in 1972. I think many of the schools that, that you all are ministering in are, I think, products of this call to innovation. Carl, would you... So in some parts they talk about how we're thinking about regional schools, regional catechetical programs um, that already in 1972, in the wake of Vatican, Vatican News, are talking about the church is changing, society is changing. How do we meet the educational needs of these different different communities? Mm -hmm. And so to different governance models, different ways, as Carl said, to kind of regionalize them. So you have kind of the um, emergence of robust superintendents' offices at the diocesan level. Um, and so that's going to be towards the end of the document. And then it's going to close with, uh, I think, um, number 155. This is probably one of my favorite quotes from the document that we are ultimately involved in a ministry of hope. And so you can read it in its entirety, but kind of that middle part um, that we face problems, but so did those who came before us, and so will those who follow. But as Christians, we are confident of our success, trusting not in ourselves, but in Jesus Christ. And so there's this great, just kind of realistic stance on the work is hard, but goodness, the work is worth it. And we should be filled with immense hope. We have Jesus Christ on our side. So kind of the last rallying cry of the document um, in paragraph 155.
So some things to consider as you read through it, then that's kind of the document in a broad overview, but some things to consider, as I mentioned before, we're seven years out from Vatican II. And so um, this slide and the next one, and again, I'm not gonna read through it, but it basically is just kind of a, a, an account of someone who had been, let's say in a, in a Catholic church on November 29th, 1964, which would have been the Sunday that all of the, liturgical changes um, that were kind of promoted within Vatican II that, that everywhere. And so just this thought that the week prior they would have gone to mass and the priest would have been facing away from them. Most of it would have been in Latin. Um, there wouldn't necessarily have been songs there. There would have been a communion rail. So there's lots of things that then the week later um, would have been very different and, and it would have been in the vernacular. So they would have sung a song to open up an introductory hymn that would have been in English, that the entire mass would have been in English, they would have been asked to participate. And so that just kind of puts into context the overall message of Vatican II, which was ultimately saying that your faith is the product of, or, or it's inspired by other people, but your faith is yours and that it requires a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And so I think this document ultimately is responding to that. Would you agree, Carl? I would. I'd say, imagine if you could time travel in your school building back to 1972 or right after Vatican II. And can you read the document as if you're sitting in your school at that time? For those of you with, you know, 100-year-old schools, 50-year-old schools, what was your school like at that time frame? Can you read it with those lenses on? And even to think, what would have been the difference from a Catholic <laughs> school? standpoint with these changes that were promulgated by Vatican II. And so to think, again, I mean, even Catholics weren't even encouraged to have Bibles because you shouldn't interpret it on your own. Like you, you shouldn't have that tool that now, I mean, goodness, breaking open God's word is, is such an important part of our faith lives. And so, I mean, that came about because of Vatican II. And, and so what you might find in this document, at least I did, is that with Vatican II, the pendulum maybe had switched, so you, I think you could make this argument that prior to Vatican II, there was a heavy emphasis on doctrine. Maybe you're familiar with the Baltimore Catechism. Um, Carl, we were talking about it just before we came on, um, like, why did God make you, right? And that response should be verbatim and, and just kind of very robotic almost, mm -hmm. right? Like, God made me to... Know him, love him, serve him in this world, this world and be happy with him in the next. In the next. And, and all Catholics were meant to know that and they did and so there would be like baltimore catechist um like kind of drills that they would go through and and students people were expected to be able to to fire off these responses that vatican ii swung in the opposite direction and there was a lot of great forward momentum to make the faith personal to say it's not as institutionalized it's not as one size fits all but that it is organic and that it's authentic in your own personal relationship with Christ. In a lot of ways, though, maybe the, the tide shifted too far in that opposite direction. So whereas doctrine had been a heavy focus up until this point, maybe it's more affective. And in fact, the document says that at, at a point where it, it talks about that the affective side is often favored over any kind of doctrine or any kind of orthodoxy. And, and so what I think though, our bishops really get right within this document is how do we successfully impart the faith to others? And I have a series of, of kind of combined terms here that the document to teach as Jesus did will use that I think if we can balance these two, if we can balance relevance with orthodoxy. So how do we make these 2000 year teachings of our church how do we make them relevant for 1972 or 2018? How do we balance faith with reason? And, and how do those two things work together and, and enhance one another? How can we both practice our faith, but also analyze it and be critical of it? How do we live yet still learn? And, and then this last one, how can we be contemporary in presentation, yet while still remaining authentic in doctrine? And Carl, again, before we came on, we were, we were talking a little bit about this. Um, how, how, how do you do this? Like, how does this come about? If I could add one more to this, sure. I would say in our faith, we sort of have a, a vertical dimension, our relationship with the Father, with God, and also our horizontal 
um, relationship with each other. And this document is clearly pretty heavy on the community and a trajectory of service to others. And maybe some of the previous documents were heavier on the uh, vertical side. But as Michael's pointing out here, our faith is usually not an either or, oftentimes it's a both and, and how do we balance those things? And I think uh, listening to others, reading broadly, understanding the context of which things were written and the audience to whom they, it was intended to be read by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's easy with any of these to kind of swing too far in either direction. Mm -hmm. Like it's easy with kind of my own individual response to, to the divine um, to maybe tend too far in that direction or to tend too far into the direction of, well, it's just about other people and, and that I don't really need to worry about my own personal relationship. It's more important that I worry about you know, the relationship of the people in front of me. And, and so obviously both are important, right? And, and again, this idea of relevance and orthodoxy, this idea of being contemporary in the way that we present things yet still remaining authentic in doctrine that really for us to be successful, we can't remember, we talked about this over the summer, um, Remix 16, that we can't just reconfessionalize. We can't just say, okay, well, what worked in 1950? Let's do it again. And so instead of Baltimore catechist drills, we're going to do Baltimore catechist tweets or something that we can't just kind of say, we're going to do it um, the same way that it worked before, but maybe just a little bit different, louder, better somehow, that we really need to, as we said over the summer, recontextualize and to say an ongoing challenge that we will have, and the document says this, that this isn't the final statement, and we know that this is not the final statement on Catholic education, um, and that in a sense, the, the bishops say that that final statement will never come, that we are gonna be continually charged with trying to contextualize the faith in our current day and age. And so I think this document definitely tries to promote that. I think, again, that pendulum, that shift, which was so needed within our church, um, people were running with that momentum, running with that tide. And, and so this is an effort from our bishops, though, to say we need to have a good balance of the two, that um, we can't just forsake doctrine for the sake of this kind of effective feeling side, um, but we can't just all focus on doctrine either. There needs, needs to be a good balance. Uh, if I could just add two yeah. quick things, that, two maybe questions to kind of carry with you. How, does, how do Catholic schools fit in the broader mission of the church? as we read each of these documents. And I think this one's uh, an interesting viewpoint. What are the quotes that they have about Catholic schools? And then secondly, what do they say are the goals of Catholic schools? And that varies in the documents that we read too. Right, right. And so in this one, and we're gonna end with kind of a look at what the, the purpose of Catholic education is and then kind of how we'll know whether or not we're being successful. Again, in a broad sense, not just schools, but Catholic education and all of its various ministries. I just wanna to pose to you friends, a statement from 1967, and this was the Land of Lakes statement. And so you may or may not be familiar with this. I wasn't actually until this past year. And this was a grouping or kind of a gathering of university presidents. Um, so Catholic colleges and uni universities, the presidents of those kind of gathered together at the invitation of Father Ted Hesper, our own former president here at the University of Notre Dame, um, to gather around, and it took place in Land Lakes, Minnesota, and to talk a little bit about how should Catholic colleges and universities function in relation to the church. And so you can read about it, there's links there. My point in bringing it up is again, to kind of extend this thought and to put into context this document that one of the ramifications of the Land of Lakes statement was by many critics at least, a lessening of the Catholic identity of many Catholic colleges and universities in favor of a secularization. And, and that, in defense of higher education, was based upon the academic freedom that we enjoy today and, and the ability to pursue truth free from any kind of, you know, people stepping on us or, or telling us that we can or can't talk about certain things or engage in certain dialogue with certain people or groups of people. And so, there are some follow-up documents that were written more recently um, by St. John Paul II that really tried to bring back into right order or into right relationship Catholic colleges and universities with the church. But again, I, I just want to put it into the context of this document, seven years out of Vatican II, that there was this almost kind of rebellion 
right, against institution of we don't want people to tell us what to do. And, and friends, you can think of the 1950s where in our own country there was great communist scares. And so people being kind of brought in front of, of others and saying, well, you're a communist. And so they were then blacklisted. Ultimately, too, in the 1960s, you have the, the Vietnam War and, and people protesting that and potentially for really the first time in outspoken ways, um, at least here in our country, that, you know, our, our country was kind of divided as far as whether or not we should be engaged in that war and people feeling that they had a voice. And so um, there's a heavy emphasis on higher education within the document. And I think, again, our bishops really try to respond to this statement from 1967. And again, to bring back into right relationship universities and colleges that are Catholic and their own Catholic identity and their, their relationship with the church. Um, Carl, I would, I would also say that I think that's part of maybe why, and, and friends, you can consider this, the document focuses in kind of a backwards way on adults and then working downwards towards kids. And to think, well, why is that? And why is there so much emphasis on adult education and ongoing education? And um, I think ultimately it could be, in a sense, just the importance of teachers. Again, this document brings out the important vocation of teachers and how critical they are. It's not just about curriculum, it's about the witness of the person in front of the classroom. Right. And so you have this quote from 104 that, again, we saw this in Divini as well as Gravissimum, that the, the teacher really needs to be that person that is an expert in content as well as instruction, but also someone that can integrate the faith into everything that they do, that they themselves have such a mature and deep faith that it comes out in all aspects of their lives. And so there's this integration of learning and life, of faith and reason that really are made manifest in the person of the teacher. And so it reminded me, this is not from To Teach As Jesus Did, but a great quote by now St. Paul the Sixth, and St. Pope Paul the Sixth. Um, modern human listens more willingly to witnesses than to teachers. And if he or she does listen to teachers, it is because they are witnesses. And so friends, this document, again, I think might spend so much time on adult education because it lifts up the important role played by ministers of Catholic education in any way, shape or form, obviously in our case, specific to Catholic school leaders as well as Catholic school teachers, but that they play an immensely important role in order for us to impart the faith to our youth, which is obviously our mission within Catholic education. As I said, to kind of wrap things up, measurement of success, and this comes from paragraph seven and eight from the document. And so paragraph seven is gonna talk about um, Catholic education, so really the purpose of it. It's an expression of the mission of Jesus Christ that was handed on to us at the great commissioning of the apostles, go and teach all nations. Um, and so our work within Catholic education is, um, is an extension of that, that we are looking for personal sanctification, we're looking for the salvation of souls, and we're looking to, to reform society as we go out and do that, to build the kingdom not only in the next life, but actually here on earth. And so then paragraph eight talks about, well, how will we know that we've done that? How will we know that we've been successful? And so there's, I think, just some really kind of, I don't want to say, um, kind of nebulous ways of doing this, but I think it would challenge us to figure out how do we measure this? So like, what will be the signs of this? That we will try to create people that hear hope in the gospel, that we will have people that base their love and service on that message of the gospel, that people will have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Like, how do you measure this? And then people that will share the gospel's real view of the human, recognizing the evil of sin, but affirming the presence of hope. And so I know within our last document for Gravissimum, a lot of um, comments were, excuse me, from Divini, um, a lot were, a lot of your reflections centered on how do we, how do we really hire for something like that? How do we as Catholic school leaders in an interview process or in, in vetting references, how do we really assess someone's faith? And so, Carl, from where you sit on the superintendent's level, I mean, that's an ongoing challenge, right? Like being able to, to kind of 
get at the heart of where is someone's relationship with Christ and to kind of put a measurement on that. It's a hard one. You can ask, you know, do you go to church or do you, what do you read? Um, what are key aspects of the way you live out your faith? Um, in your last teaching job, how do you interact with your kids in terms of faith, whatever subject matter you taught? Um, it is a challenge, but I think you need to really ask open-ended questions and getting people talking about an area that oftentimes we're not comfortable sharing personal stories about our faith. Right. right. And so maybe to teach as Jesus did kind of gives you a good formula in the sense of that you as a disciple with hope to bring it, you're someone that will make God known, loved, and served. And so think of this kind of interplay of, of the three different components of the threefold purposes of Catholic education here that are put out by to teach as Jesus did, that you are someone that embodies and can kind of bring together the intellect, the faith, and service that, again, there's an integration of head, of heart, of your body, um, and that ultimately people that can intertwine this strong message and, and teaching of Jesus, and then a way that we enter into community with others and do that through the sacraments and liturgical worship. And then ultimately to go out and to make the world better through service. And so maybe, maybe these are ways that you can kind of think about how does that person talk about their faith? Like how willing are they to express it? What is their view of community? And, and how do they talk about their colleagues from their past places of employment and um, even their kids, right? Um, and then finally, like, what do you see as their service mentality? Like what is their, what does their heart really tell you about how they view what they do in a vocational way? I think those four terms there that Michael has, uh, as you walk about the building, as you enter classrooms, you know, it's easy to kind of put a number on certain academic performance, but how would you grade your school on message and doctrine? How would you rank your school on community, on worship and service? So it's, it's easy to do a lesson plan, but how much time do you put into really doing liturgy and worship well? Uh, the visuals, the audio, um, that the bishops are clearly lifting up saying, here are the lenses that we want you to look at Catholic education. All right, so can we put those lenses on and look at our school community uh, through those four lenses? Awesome. And so friends, just to close, um, we want to just thank you for all of your good work and in being disciples with hope to bring, keep bringing hope. And again, we have every reason for hope as this document will end. And we do from where we sit here underneath the Golden Dome. We have every reason for hope because of outstanding dynamic transformational Catholic school leaders like all of you. So Remick leaders, keep up the amazing work. Um, Carl, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and, and help us with to teach as Jesus did. Remick 16, good luck, God bless, and go Irish. <laughs>